The ASUS Zephyrus G GA502 gaming laptop pairs an AMD Ryzen CPU with Nvidia graphics in a thinner machine. So let's check it out in this detailed review and help you decide if it's worth it. Starting with the specs, there's an AMD Ryzen 7 3750H quad-core CPU, Nvidia GTX 1660 Ti Max-Q graphics, and mine has 16GB of memory and dual channel, though the Ryzen mobile platform only supports memory up to DDR4-2400. There's a 15.6-inch 1080p 120Hz screen, and a 512GB NVMe M.2 SSD in one of the two slots. For network connectivity, it's got Gigabit Ethernet, 802.11 AC Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth 5. And you can find links to updated pricing linked in the description. The GA502 has a brushed black metal lid with the ROG logo towards the side, while the interior is all matte black plastic. But overall, the build quality felt good, and there were no sharp corners or edges anywhere. ASUS lists the weight of the laptop at 2.1 kilos, and mine was spot on with this. With the 180 watt power brick and cables for charging included, the total weight rises a little above 2.6 kilos. The dimensions of the GA502 are 36 centimeters in width, 25.2 centimeters in depth, and around 2 centimeters in height. So on the smaller side for a 15 inch machine. These smaller dimensions allow the screen to have thin bezels with a 81% screen to body ratio. I measured them at 9 millimeters on the sides. The 15.6 inch 1080p 120Hz IPS level panel is 6 bit, and I couldn't see FreeSync available through the Nvidia control panel. I've measured the color gamut using the Spider 5 Pro and got 63% of sRGB, 45% of NTSC, and 47% of Adobe RGB. At 100% brightness, I measured the panel at 284 nits in the center and with a 1040 to 1 contrast ratio. So above average contrast, but a little lower than the standard 300 nits I like to see. The color gamut is on the lower side, but not too unexpected for a gaming laptop at this price point. It's fine for gaming, but I'd look elsewhere if you're after photo or video editing. Backlight bleed wasn't very good in my unit. The section down the bottom left corner in particular was occasionally noticeable in games during darker scenes, but this will vary between laptop and panel. There was some screen flex as the lid is on the thinner side, but the metal build and hinges being out towards the corners made it feel sturdy. It was easy to open up with one finger, demonstrating an even weight distribution, and it felt fine sitting on my lap. The GA502 doesn't actually have a camera built in, and unlike the more expensive GX701, there wasn't one included in the box. Although there's no camera, it does still have a microphone, and this is what it sounds like. The keyboard has white backlighting, no RGB or customization is possible here, but even all secondary key functions are illuminated. I liked typing on the keyboard, here's how it sounds to give you an idea of what to expect. I didn't like the small arrow keys, and these can also be used with the function key to adjust keyboard brightness between three levels or turned off. Just above the keyboard, we've got extra buttons to change the volume, mute microphone, and a shortcut to the Armory Crate software, which is the control panel for this laptop. There was only a bit of keyboard flex while pushing down hard, it was quite sturdy. The precision touchpad worked well, it's smooth to the touch, clicks down anywhere, and has the usual gestures. Fingerprints were harder to see on the interior as it's not a perfectly smooth texture, but this also made it a little harder to clean. On the left from the back there's the power input, gigabit ethernet, and I prefer the way it's facing as you don't have to lift the machine up to unplug it, HDMI 2.0b output, USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type A port, USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type C port with DisplayPort 1.4 support, no Thunderbolt though, and 3.5mm audio combo jack. On the right from the front there are two more USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type A ports, an air exhaust vent, and Kensington lock. On the back are air exhaust vents towards the corners, and then nothing at all on the front. Underneath, the thick rubber feet did a good job of preventing movement while in use. And there are only air intake vents over the memory slot and heat pipes. Although it looks like there are vents over where the fans are, these are actually blocked off. On the brushed metal lid, the ROG logo lights up red while the laptop is powered on, and I wasn't able to customize this. The back of the lid is cut out down the bottom, which lets you see the status LEDs with the lid closed and this is also meant to help air get into the vents above the keyboard. The two speakers are found towards the front left and right corners, and they sounded good for a laptop, definitely above average with some bass present. They get loud enough while playing music, and the latency mon results looked good. Speaking of sounds, it plays this one by default on boot. Fortunately, you can disable this either through the Armory Crate software or BIOS. 
To get inside, we need to take out 15 Phillips head screws. Once inside from left to right, we've got the Wi-Fi card, first M.2 slot next to that with our NVMe SSD installed, battery underneath here, single memory slot, and second M.2 slot. However, it's worth noting both M.2 slots are only two lanes of PCIe rather than your typical four. As we can see, there's just the one so dim memory slot on the motherboard. This is because the GA502 comes with eight or 16 gigs soldered to the motherboard in single channel so it will be slower without a stick installed here. Mine also has an 8 gig stick installed for 16 gig in total though, which does allow it to run faster in dual channel and it supports up to 32 gig. Powering the laptop is a 76 watt hour battery. I've tested it with the screen brightness at 50%, background apps disabled and all keyboard lighting off. While just watching YouTube videos, I got a very impressive result for a gaming laptop. Well over 7 hours. The Vega graphics were in use during this test with Nvidia Optimus and this was providing at least a couple hours more than what we'd usually get with a similarly specced Intel laptop. While playing The Witcher 3 with medium settings and Nvidia's battery boost set to 30 FPS, the average frame rate was sitting around 26, not quite able to hit the cap. The battery lasted for an hour and 42 minutes in total, but after the first hour and a half with 10% charge left, the frame rate dipped to 13 FPS and was no longer playable. I didn't have any battery drain with the 180 watt power brick, so it seems to be plenty for these specs. And I'll also note that you can't use turbo mode when on battery power, more on that soon. Let's move on to the thermal testing. The Zephyrus design is traditionally known for raising the back of the machine up to improve airflow. However, this feature is not present in this more budget friendly, less premium design. Air is primarily brought in through the keyboard and vents above it. And as discussed earlier, the vents directly above the fans underneath were blocked off forcing air underneath to first come in over the heat pipes and memory slot. Inside we've got a few heat pipes, with a couple shared between the processor and graphics. And we can see that air is exhausted out the side and back with the left fan, and just out the back for the opposite fan. The ASUS Armory Crate software allows you to change between three different modes, silent, performance and turbo, and I've tested all three. Basically these modes adjust maximum fan speed, CPU power limits, and control GPU overclocking, as defined here. You can easily swap between these modes through software, or by holding the function key and pressing F5, the key with the fan icon. Thermal testing was completed in an ambient room temperature of 21 degrees Celsius, so expect different results in different environments. No CPU undervolting has been done, as this is not currently possible with AMD mobile CPUs. At idle, both the CPU and GPU were on the warmer side, though realistically not a problem and the fans were quiet, as you'll hear later. The rest of the results are from combined CPU and GPU workloads, and are meant to represent worst case scenarios as I ran them for extended periods of time. The gaming results towards the upper half of the graph were tested by playing Watch Dogs 2, as I find it to use a good combination of processor and graphics. The stress test results shown on the lower half of the graph are from running the ADA64 CPU stress test with only the stress CPU option checked, and the Heaven GPU benchmark at max settings at the same time to fully load the system. Starting with the stress tests, in silent mode, the 1660 Ti Max-Q was thermal throttling at 86 degrees Celsius. If we change to performance mode, the GPU thermal throttling is removed as this boosts the fan speed. However, the CPU was now hotter as this mode raises its power limit. I think it was thermal throttling. However, hardware info doesn't currently report on this for the 3750H CPU, so I can't say for sure. There were no differences in temperatures with performance or turbo mode, because as you'll hear later, the fan speed didn't actually change in this workload. Using a cooling pad did help a little, despite the vents directly above the fans being blocked off by the bottom panel as we saw earlier. The gaming results saw a similar trend, with some GPU thermal throttling in silent mode, with slight improvements to thermals as we continue making changes. These are the average clock speeds for the same tests just shown. In silent mode, we're seeing lower CPU clock speeds compared to the other tests as this mode caps the CPU power limit to 8 watts. Although the clock speeds in Watch Dogs 2 look good here, the game was actually unplayable, but we'll check out some FPS benchmarks with different modes soon. In performance mode, there's a nice boost to CPU clock speed as the power limit raises to around 21 watts. And the GPU sees an increase too, as this boosts fan speed and removes thermal throttling. Turbo mode saw no change to CPU performance due to suspected CPU thermal throttling. However, the reported GPU clock speed raises due to the overclocking turbo mode applies. As there was more thermal headroom for the gaming test, the performance and turbo modes are making more noticeable improvements. The cooling pad makes a big improvement to the CPU clock speed while under stress test, as it helps address the CPU thermal throttling. However, it hardly did anything while playing this particular game as temperatures weren't too bad without it. 
These are the TDP values during these same tests. I've used hardware info for the GPU, shown by the green bars, and we're not hitting the 60 watt power limit of the 1660Ti Max-Q with silent mode enabled, due to the GPU thermal throttling covered earlier. Hardware info still seems to incorrectly report the TDP for the 3750H CPU, so I've used AMD's UProf tool instead. However, as this didn't really give an average over time, these results are only approximate values. I don't have results for the gaming tests, because without a consistent load it was difficult to report an average. The 3750H has a 35 watt TDP, and this is only hit once the cooling pad is in use. And as this is only hit once the cooling pad is in use, it sort of implies that we were thermal throttling in this workload without it. Though as we saw, this seemed to be less of a problem with an actual game running. These are the TDP values I was seeing reported by UProf while under a CPU only workload. So it looks like performance mode has a 28 watt limit. Though this was not being hit under combined CPU and GPU loads, as we just saw before due to thermal limitations. These are the average clock speeds under these same workloads. As the power limit increases, so does the clock speed and performance. More power and performance typically equals more heat. However, we saw the highest temperatures in silent mode, simply because the fan speed was so much quieter when compared to performance or turbo modes. To demonstrate how this translates into performance, I've got some Cinebench CPU benchmarks. With Intel's last gen i5-8300H quad-core CPU in red just for comparison. Though keep in mind the i5 does have a higher 45 watt TDP limit. I've compared these two in a separate video if you're interested in more comparisons. As for the external temperatures where you'll actually be putting your hands, at idle it was a bit warmer than the standard 30 degrees I usually see, mainly towards the back. With the stress tests running in silent mode, it's in the mid 50s in the center, getting up to 60s right up the back where it was hot to the touch. It was a bit cooler in performance mode as this raises fan speed, and we can see the cooler spots on the left and right where the fans bring in air through the keyboard. There wasn't much difference in turbo mode, still getting to 60 right at the back, but for the areas you'll actually be touching, it's not too bad. Here's what the fans sound like during these different tests. At idle in silent mode, the fan was only just audible. With silent mode and the stress tests running, it's much quieter compared to most other laptops I've tested. In performance or turbo mode, the fan speed was the same, and pretty average when compared to most other gaming laptops I've tested. I forgot to test fan speed while gaming, and although it will vary by game, I did notice that while in performance mode, the fan speed did drop back a couple of decibels when not being smashed with a stress test. Overall, the ASUS GA502 gaming laptop will thermal throttle on the graphics in silent mode, which isn't too surprising given the slower fan speed. Thermal throttling was seen on the CPU under combined multi-core and GPU stress test, even with the higher fan speeds. However, this was still noticeably cooler compared to the 90 plus we usually see from Intel-based laptops under the same workload. It was possible to cool it down a bit with a cooling pad, though I suspect this would have helped out more if the vents above the fans weren't blocked off. Next, let's look at some gaming benchmarks. I've tested these with turbo mode enabled for best performance, but we'll test with some different performance modes afterwards. Battlefield 5 was tested in campaign mode, and at ultra settings it was still playable and able to average above 60 FPS, with up to 90 reached at low settings. Apex Legends was tested with either all settings at maximum or all settings at the lowest possible values, as it doesn't have predefined setting presets. A recent Nvidia driver update boosted performance of this game, so we're seeing pretty good results here. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was tested with the built in benchmark, and at max settings were just under 60 FPS, not too bad, and lower settings weren't really improving this by that much, but we'll see how this game compares with other laptops soon. Far Cry New Dawn was tested with the built in benchmark, and although the results were lower compared to most other laptops I've tested, as this test is heavier on the CPU, 60 FPS was still hit at normal settings. Fortnite was tested with the replay feature, and as a less demanding game, even at epic settings, the average frame rate was still quite good and playing fine, though we could get much higher FPS at lower settings to take advantage of the 120Hz panel. Overwatch is another well optimized game and was tested in the practice range, and it was running fine even at max settings, with the average frame rate still close to the refresh rate of the display. Rainbow Six Siege was tested with the built in benchmark. At maximum settings, 100 FPS averages were still being hit in this test with a 100% render scale, while high settings took us to the refresh rate of the screen. 
PUBG was tested using the replay feature, and high settings and below were all around the 100fps point with not really that much of a difference, while ultra settings was still above 60fps too. Assassin's Creed Odyssey was tested with the built-in benchmark, and this seems to be a CPU heavy test. Though I don't think it needs a super high frame rate to play, so these results aren't too bad. CSGO was tested using the Uletical FPS benchmark, and as a game that depends primarily on CPU power, it was around 100 FPS lower than an i7 based laptop. However 150 FPS at max settings is still plenty to play this game well. Dota 2 was tested playing in the middle lane, and as a primarily CPU driven game the results are a bit lower compared to an Intel based laptop. However the performance from this machine was still great, with 100 FPS averages at ultra settings, while high settings better took advantage of the 120Hz display. Watch Dogs 2 is a resource heavy game, however I think it plays fine with a solid 30 FPS, and we're only just a little below this for the 1% low at ultra settings, and it was playing ok even maxed out. The Witcher 3 was still playable at ultra settings and was averaging right on 60 FPS. However high settings did play nicer, as shown by the 1% low which was close to the average frame rate at ultra. If you're after more gaming benchmarks on the GA502 check the card in the top right corner where I've tested 20 games in total. Let's also take a look at how this config of the ASUS Zephyrus G GA502 compares with other laptops. Use these results as a rough guide only, as they were tested at different times with different drivers. In Battlefield 5 I've got the GA502 highlighted in red near similarly spec machines. It's worth noting the L340 beneath it is the only machine in this graph that had single channel memory. The performance was actually quite similar to the FX505DU, which has the same Ryzen CPU but non max q graphics. We can see the higher 1% low result with the Dell G3, which has the same graphics but has the higher performing i7 CPU, however average FPS doesn't change too much between them. These are the results from Far Cry 5 with ultra settings in the built in benchmark. Again the results were close to the FX505DU just above it. I think the higher average FPS is due to the non max q 1660 Ti though, as they've got the same Ryzen 7 3750H CPU. The Dell G3 with same 1660 Ti max q graphics is a fair amount ahead though, which makes sense as this is a CPU heavy game, and it's both faster and has a 50% higher core count. These are the results from Shadow of the Tomb Raider with the built in benchmark at highest settings. Interestingly this time the GA502 came a little ahead of the FX505DU. I'm thinking this may be due to updates the game has had or possibly Nvidia driver updates since I tested the 505, as it otherwise doesn't really make sense given it had the same Ryzen 7 CPU but slightly better graphics. Overall the ASUS ROG Zephyrus GA502 gaming laptop is performing fairly well. Unfortunately I haven't tested all that many other machines with similar specs to compare against, but as we've seen here it is able to perform quite well in most games even at higher setting levels, and is capable of providing a good gaming experience. As we saw earlier we've got the option of using silent, performance or turbo mode, so let's see how these modes actually affect game performance. Battlefield 5 was tested in campaign mode at ultra settings, with silent mode enabled it was still quite usable. The 1% low wasn't too different to the other results, and it was only around 15 FPS lower compared to turbo mode with much louder fans. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was tested with the built in benchmark at highest settings. Again there wasn't much difference to frame rate between performance and turbo mode, however silent was a fair bit lower this time. Far Cry 5 was tested with the built in benchmark at ultra settings. In this test there was a much larger drop with the silent profile in use. And like I mentioned before, I couldn't play Watch Dogs 2 in silent mode, so it seems to vary by game. Basically I wouldn't rely on silent mode for quieter gaming. I did test these games at max settings though, they will likely be more playable with lower settings, but this does show you the difference between the modes. I did have some issues trying to play games with Vulcan though, basically they seemed to fail to detect the Nvidia graphics and would error and not open. I had this same problem with the FX505DU which also has an AMD CPU and Nvidia GPU, but I was able to bypass it by disabling the Vega graphics through device manager. However that workaround didn't allow me to play Vulkan games here, so hopefully this gets fixed in a future update. If the game supports something other than Vulkan you can still play it just fine. Now for the benchmarking tools, I've tested Heaven, Valley and Superposition from Unigen, as well as Firestrike, TimeSpy and VRMark from 3DMark. Just pause the video if you want a detailed look at these results. I've used Crystal Diskmark to test the storage, and the 512GB NVMe M.2 SSD was performing ok. 
Remember, both M.2 slots are going to be limited to 2 PCIe lane speed. For updated pricing, check the links in the description, as prices will change over time. At the time of recording, in the US it's going for around $1200 US dollars, although it does go on sale from time to time. I think this price is a bit too high when you consider that the Acer Helios 300 goes from $1100 to $1200 US dollars, and even as low as $1000 on sale. As we saw earlier, it performs significantly better as it's got a 6 core higher clocked CPU with non max q graphics. So I'd only consider the GA502 if you're able to get it for a good deal. With all of that in mind, let's conclude by covering the good and bad aspects of the ASUS Zephyrus G GA502 DU gaming laptop. Overall, the AMD Ryzen 7 3750H and NVIDIA GTX 1660 Ti Max-Q combination is offering decent gaming performance. However, it's worth keeping in mind that the last gen i5-8300H does outperform it. A benefit I've noticed with these Ryzen based laptops though is that they tend to run cooler compared to Intel options. Possibly due to the lower TDP, less power equals less heat. The Ryzen CPU does have some nice advantages though. The Vega graphics built into the CPU are better than Intel's integrated graphics. And we saw this in the battery testing, where I got one of the best results for a gaming laptop. It was possible to improve thermals a bit with the cooling pad, despite the vents directly above the intake fans being blocked off. However, undervolting with Ryzen is unfortunately not an option at the moment. I'm not a fan of the soldered memory to the motherboard. My unit only has 8GB, but I think it's also available with 16GB. And you do still have the option of running dual channel if you have a stick in the single slot. It was also good to see 2M.2 slots considering this is a smaller 15 inch machine. Especially when the larger and far more expensive ASUS GX701 only has one. Though they are limited to 2 PCIe lanes, which will reduce speeds if you use faster drives. The screen looked okay for gaming, but the 6 bit panel with lower brightness was on the lower side in terms of colour gamut. Again, especially compared to the far superior panel in the Helios 300 which can be picked up for similar money. And the backlight bleed in my unit wasn't great either. There's no camera built into the laptop, so you'll need to use an external one if you need one, however it does still have a microphone. I wasn't personally a fan of the smaller arrow keys, but the keyboard was otherwise good to type with and no issues with the touchpad. The strange issue with Vulkan games that I first identified months ago still seems to be present with these AMD and Nvidia laptops, so hopefully that gets fixed in the future. In the end though, purely in terms of gaming performance, the GA502 does perform well with decent settings in most games while coming in a slimmer and lighter package. But I would only be considering it on a good sale, as there's just a lot of competition at this price point. Let me know what you thought about the ASUS Zephyrus G gaming laptop down in the comments. And if you're new to the channel, consider getting subscribed for future laptop reviews and tech videos like this one.